Yeah, there you go. Session three, that's what we're on. So you have only got two more sessions. If you have repented and trusted Christ as your Savior and you have been baptized, then you can join the church. So congratulations. So after next week, that following Sunday, if you want to join the church, you come down in a slew of human beings to the stage and overwhelm Pete and myself and say, I want to be a member of Calvary. And I will be like, awesome, we can do that. But tonight we are talking about something that impacts every aspect of our lives, and that's worship. Um, everything that we do is considered worship. So every single thing that you do is considered worship, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. But if you're breathing, if you're taking a breath in, we're taking a breath out. You're worshiping. And somebody sent me this this week, or this past week, and I've, I've seen it before. It's really cool. Like when you breathe in and when you breathe out, it sounds like you're saying Yahweh. So take a second to breathe in and breathe out and just listen to what it sounds like. You hear that? It's kind of interesting. What is God's name? Yahweh. Saying. I mean, it may not be biblical, but I think it's pretty cool. But every breath that we have is a gift from God. And so everything that we do is worship because God has given us the opportunity to worship him in everything that we do. So tonight we're talking about what does it mean to worship. So there's two different types of worship that we're going to focus on, or two aspects. First of all, it's personal. Now I'm going to go ahead and give you the second one as well, but we're going to focus on personal for a little bit, and then we're going to get into the second one. The second one is corporate. That means like what we're doing right now is corporate worship. When we go to the sanctuary over there, that's corporate worship. Where two or more are gathered in my name, as Jesus said, that is corporate worship. So the first verse I want to share with you is Luke 5.16. I don't think that was up there, is it? Luke 5.16, it is? Okay, cool. So if you want to write that one down, it talks about Jesus to where he gets done doing this miracle. And 516 says that Jesus goes off by himself and he prays. It says, yeah, he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. So if Jesus, the son of God, took time by himself to pray, then we should do that, too. We need that personal time with God. So that means like reading your Bible. You guys have heard the term quiet time before. That's exactly what that's talking about. Taking time away from everything else, away from distractions, taking your phone and putting it on silent, taking it to the other side of the house, leaving it in the house and walking outside. I know it's the middle of the summer, but finding time to where you get away from everything and all you do is focus on God. So that means opening your Bible and reading a few verses or reading a few chapters. One of the things I love to do is just go through the Psalms. Like if I really just want to take a break from reality and just soak up what God has to say, I'll read one of the Psalms in Scripture. And there's one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you tonight at the end of the service that is just extremely impactful, and it's great. So just read one of the Psalms or meditate, like memorize Scripture and then think about it throughout the day. You know, if, if you're reading through, like I read or I listen to the Bible when I drive down the road for my daily Bible reading stuff. And there's some times to where God's like, this is it. And I'll stop, I'll highlight it, I'll go back and listen to it later or read it later, and I'll just sit there and think about that verse. You know, what is God saying to me? What does God want me to listen, or how does God want me to listen about this? What does he want me to do from it? So reading your Bible, praying, meditating on Scripture. And there's other things you can do as well, like if you're riding down the road and you're listening to a song and you're like, man, Jesus is getting me with this one, just shouting at the top of your lungs and singing if you feel led to do so. And again, it doesn't have to be K-Love. It can be something a different kind of song that praises Jesus and talks about Jesus. But when we're looking at personal worship, there's a few different um, aspects or a few different types that we can look at. So one of the things that we really need to do when we're looking at um, personal worship is attention to God. So Revelation 4, 8b says, Holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And when we talk about paying attention to God, that means remembering the fact that God is holy. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. He's the creator of the universe. When I was in youth, there was this whole thing about people would wear these hats and buy these shirts, and it would say, Jesus is my homeboy. And like my best friend had one of those hats, and I thought it was stupid. But there was a guy, we were at this youth conference, and this guy gets on stage, and he says, look, he said, if you think Jesus is your homeboy, you have forgotten the fact that he is also an eternal and all-powerful God. And so if we go into prayer thinking that Jesus is just like us or that God is just like us, we've already missed the point of prayer. Because I'm not going to go to you and say, hey, I need this. Like, Randy, you may do it. You may give me money or whatever. But we're supposed to go to God about these things. We're supposed to go to the one who can give us whatever we need, not necessarily what we want. And so if we think that God is like us or that Jesus is like us, we've already mistaken who God is. 
And so we have to understand that he's worthy to be praised. In Revelation, in Isaiah, the angels are gathering around God and they're worshiping him. And so we should do the same. And so when we talk about worship to God, our worship, and our worship should not have to be approved by men. And what I mean by that is if you are truly worshiping God, it should not matter that people are looking at you. It should not matter what they think about you. All that matters is the fact that you are focused one-on-one -on -one with God. And so if you're at school and you feel the Holy Spirit saying you need to pray, don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Just stop and pray. If he says, hey, open your Bible and read. If you're in the middle of the cafeteria, just open your Bible and read it. Because at the end of the day, whether people like you or not doesn't matter. But what matters is if the Holy Spirit is compelling you to worship, do it. Because there's a reason for that. We talked in our Sunday school class a couple weeks ago about Paul was planning on going through Asia and hitting these different towns and stuff. And the Holy Spirit said, don't go there. And he's like, man, I'm going to go and I'm going to share the gospel with these people. It's going to be great. We're going to establish a new church. I'm kind of inferring here. But the Holy Spirit forbids him to go to these cities. And I asked the, cl the class, I said, how do we handle when the Holy Spirit tells us not to share the gospel with someone? And what we see later on is that that was not Paul's purpose in that moment. His purpose was to be obedient to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had already sent someone a vision saying that Paul's coming. And so had he been ignorant to the Holy Spirit or ignored him and did what he wanted to do, he would have missed this whole thing. And so if the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, you really need to do it. Because that means you're being obedient. That means you're worshiping. But the second thing about it, too, is our devotion is to God, not to people. I don't worship so you like me or so you think that I'm spiritual. I don't worship so people think that I'm feeling it. There's a lot of times to where, like, I'll be standing in the front row and I'll standing like this, but I'm worshiping. A lot of times when I pray, I put my hands behind my back because I'm worshiping. And the reason for that is because at least for myself, when I put my hands behind my back, that's a sign of submission. And I'm saying, God, you have permission to do whatever it is that you want to do. You know, when you get arrested by the police, they walk you out like this. You can't really do anything. And if you run, they tase you or shoot you. This is me saying, God, I surrender. Do whatever it is that you want to do. When I do this, I'm worshiping. I'm not always going to raise my hands up. People that do that, that's awesome. But not everybody's called to do that. Not everybody feels compelled to do that. There are songs that we sing that everybody stands up, and I'm like, the Holy Spirit's not telling me to stand up. I'm not going to stand up. Because then I'm just trying to make myself look like everyone else. And worship is not about me getting the approval of everyone sitting in the room. Worship is not about you getting the approval of everyone sitting in the room. Worship is about you coming before God, humbly acknowledging who He is, and being in the right mindset and understanding it. But... God is the one that evaluates your worship. Not me, not anyone else. That's between you and God. So if it's real, you're going to honor God. If it's not real, but everyone thinks that you're doing a super awesome, a super awesome job because you look spiritual, God is not going to honor that. And so we have to make sure that our heart is where it needs to be before we ever stand up or raise our hands or sing out or anything else. Because this is about God, it's not about us. So it doesn't matter how many times you're in service doing this and swaying or whatever or kneeling at the altar. If God has not called you to do that, if God has not brought you to the point to where you need to do that, then God's not going to honor it. It's not. And so it's not about the, your hands being raised. It's not about kneeling at the altar or the style of music or the translation the Bible is or the preacher is using. If we are focused on what everyone else is thinking around us, it is impossible for us to worship God. If we're focused on the fact, I don't like this song. Or, I don't like the translation of the Bible he's using. He, only should, he should only use this translation instead of another. Or, look at what that person's wearing over there. If that's what we're staring at and that's what we're paying attention to and we're being distracted from the Word of God or from God moving, then we're not worshiping God. You guys understand that? When we come here, it's not about us. Every breath that we take is not about us. You don't deserve those breaths. God has given them to you so that you can worship Him. So let me ask you this. How many of you have ever seen Endgame? You know, Marvel, Avengers Endgame. What's at the end of the movie? What's at the end of the movie? What is that? Does that roll after the credits or before? What happens at the post credit scene? Nothing? Okay, what about Infinity War? Okay, so when you guys saw that, 
any other Marvel movie that has an end credit scene? How many of you Googled to see what was going on? Anybody do it? You watch a Marvel movie, you see the end credit scene, like, oh, snap! You're trying to look and see what's about to happen or get some kind of insight of what's going to happen. Well, I guess I'm not a true Marvel fan because I Googled that junk. I was like, what is about to happen? But how many of you talked about the movie the next day? Or the same day? You still talk about it. Okay. So we pay money to go in to see this movie. Everyone's excited about it. Everyone's talking about it. I mean, the movies are pretty solid. I'm not going to lie. But we get excited about it. We are excited about going to see it while we're watching it, what happens afterwards. And we're just left thinking, you know, how much greater can this get? Infinity War was better than Endgame, by the way. But it was. And so in these end credit scenes, they give plot holes, there are plot points, they give cliffhangers, they give more info. We're locked into the entire movie. How many of you had to go to the restroom during the movie but didn't do it because you didn't want to miss anything? And so we're, we're locked in, we're entranced by the action. We don't leave until that final scene so that we can talk about it later. We find people and we talk to them about it, right? We speculate as to what's about to happen. We really want to know and figure this thing out. It captivates our minds, our conversations, and for some of us, our Google searches. <laughs> but how do we treat worship? Are you as excited about worship as you are about going to a Marvel movie? Do we find people and talk to them about what I or Pete or anyone else preached about? Or about the songs that we're saying? Or about what's about to happen in Acts as we go into the next week? Do you seek people out? Do you Google information so you can learn more? You guys get what I'm saying? There's a logical disconnect between worship and secularism. Because Marvel is the world. But when we come here, when we proclaim that we worship an almighty God who died for our sins and resurrected and is giving us eternal life, it's like we're just here to be here. We're not truly here to dig in and to worship God because this is going to last you an eternity. That lasts you about two and a half hours. So which one is more significant? Are we worshiping God or are we worshiping the world? Are we worshiping God or are we worshiping Disney? Because we pay Disney our money to go see this movie so we can be entertained. But how many people in the church don't tithe? How many people don't give? Or give of their time, give of their, their money or anything else? Our priorities are messed up because our worship is not where it's supposed to be, which means that we probably don't understand what worship really is. So worship earnestly. This means with passion, with sincerity, with intention. As passionate as you are about the movie or about sports or about anything else, we should be even more passionate about God, about our faith. We should not be scared to go and tell people what Christ has done in our lives. If you truly are a believer in Christ, you have a testimony. And that means you should be able to go and tell someone, hey, let me tell you what Jesus did in my life. Instead of, let me tell you how Thanos got his hand cut off and his head cut off. But we shy away from that because we feel like that we can't talk about it because it's going to make people uncomfortable. People have no problem talking about Georgia football. I'll tell you, that makes me uncomfortable. I'm just saying that we pick and choose what we think is significant. And yet it never boils down to Christ as the most significant. And so we put them on the back burner, maybe because we think we, we can skirt through until we die and then we get to go to heaven anyway. But Jesus didn't save us for us to be mediocre. He didn't save us for us to not take our faith seriously. So when we worship, we need to worship with passion. We need to worship with sincerity. Like, Jesus, I really want to worship you. God, I'm here because you have given me life. And you've given me new life. New life. When we come to church, we need to be intentional. Are we praying before we come to church, saying, God, this is about you. I want to worship you. Get any distractions away from me. Or especially on Sunday morning, are we thinking about where are we going to go eat? Or, you know, when you're adults, you argue with each other before you get in the car. Your kid does something stupid and you're like, why can you do that? We've got to go to church. We'll handle this later. But we've got to be passionate about Christ. We've got to be sincere about Christ. We've got to be intentional about Christ. Sincerity talks about the quality of being free from pretense or deceit or hypocrisy. Are you the same person here tonight as you are at school? or as you are at home, as you are when you're on your cell phone and nobody's watching. This means that we don't have to lie to each other or put on a mask. Jesus calls people like this hypocrites, and he actually says it's like a whitewashed tomb. And what that means is the outside is beautiful, but the inside is full of dead bones. The inside is nasty. 
it's smelly, it's disgusting. Because we are focused on what everyone else thinks about us as opposed to what God thinks. And so our worship is not always driven towards worshiping God, but it's driven towards making other people think that we're spiritual. And that's not what worship is. That's what the Pharisees did. That's being a whitewashed tomb. And so intentional, of course, of action. So you plan or your objective is to focus on God when you come here. Focus on God when you wake up in the morning, when you open your Bible, when you pray, when you drive down the road. That was for me. When you do all these things, focus on God. Focus on how you can glorify God. Because otherwise we're wasting our lives. God did not save you to be like the world. He did not save you to turn around and worship the world. He saved you so that you could worship Him and do so in His presence. So the way we look in a mirror, gazing at ourselves, you know, I look at the mirror sometimes and my hair goes all over the place, especially when you first wake up in the morning. Nobody walks out of their house without looking at their hair unless you don't have any. And so you stand in the mirror, you look, you make sure there's, that your hair is where it needs to be, you make sure you don't have any pimples, or your face is oily, make sure you don't have like a stain on your t-shirt or anything else. Because you don't want to leave the house looking ratchet, if y'all still say that. Is that, is that still the, the word? Okay, what's the new word? No, we busted. Okay, we'll go with that. Looking busted. Nobody wants to leave the house looking busted. So you all get your new, your new uh, outfits for the first day of school. Girls trying to look all cute and guys are just trying not to get made fun of. But you make sure that you are perfect before you leave the house. What if we stared at God the way we stare at ourselves in the mirror? Not saying that God is at fault, but what if we try to match that reflection? If we say, God, I know that I'm broken, but I can look to you and I know that you can fix me. You can reveal my flaws and show me my weaknesses and bring me to the point to where I can look more and more like Christ. What if when you look in that mirror, you see Jesus? You're not worried about how your hair looks. You're not worried about what kind of outfit you have on, but you see Jesus staring back at you because you've been obedient, because you're growing in your faith, because you are doing everything that you can to worship God with every breath that you have. Do you want to look more like yourself or do you want to look more like Jesus? That's worship. So we should gaze at God more deeply, more intently than we look in a mirror so that we can better know Him by studying His Word. We can better understand Him by studying His Word, by listening to the Holy Spirit so that we may be able to better worship Him because God is worthy of worship. You have a question? No, you can ask me later. But... We have to focus on that. Every time you go into worship, it should be led by passion, by sincerity and intention. Now, let me clarify this. Passion does not mean running up and down the aisles and screaming and making goofy faces and everything else. But the definition of passion is talking about an emotional response that is barely under control. That's barely under control. And so that means it's not always external. But your passion is what drives you, what motivates you, what makes you endure no matter what. Sounds like Paul talking about enduring in Scripture. Your passion is what drives you. What are you passionate about? Why do you wake up every morning excited about something? We should be passionate when we worship. We should be passionate about Christ. Are you passionate about God moving in your life? Do you really want Him to be the Lord of your life? When you worship, it is it intentionally to hear from Him? Or is it to make yourself look better in front of everyone else? And then this question, how much do you actually want God involved in your life? The effort you put in shows how close you actually want to be with God. If you call yourself a Christian, but you never read your Bible, you may still come to church every time the doors are open, but you never take it seriously. You don't take the effort to grow in your faith alone. Then that means you really don't want God to be a part of your life. You want what God has to offer, but you don't want God himself. Because if we truly wanted Christ in our lives, we would do everything that we could to spend time with Him, to be with Him. The way that you fawn after that girl or that boy, the way that you want to get that job so you can buy that certain thing, our passion, our desire should be pointed to Christ. If we want a relationship with a person, we're going to do everything we can to get close to them. If you truly want to have a relationship with Christ, you are going to do everything you can to get close to Him. 
Because this relationship with Christ is not about heaven. And I've told you guys this before. It's not about getting to heaven. That's, that's what's going to happen if you know Christ. But the relationship is about knowing your Creator, knowing your Savior in an intimate way. And that's different. That's not just about going to heaven. I mean, you can go just about anywhere. But heaven is, is part of it, but it's not the main thing. The main thing is Jesus. If we're not worshiping God and we only want to go to heaven, then we may miss heaven. Because it's about Christ. It's not about us. So let's look at John 4, 23. It says, But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such a people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. So how do we worship in spirit and truth? You guys understand that God's not confined to the church, right? God doesn't just exist in this building. In the Old Testament, God allowed himself to be confined to the Holy of Holies in the temple, which was on one place in the entire earth. Whenever Christ died and he was resurrected, it says that the veil ripped in two. Well, when, he, when he died, the veil ripped in two. Because God was telling us that now he is available wherever we are. As Christians, you are the Holy of Holies. You are the temple. If you are a believer in Christ, God dwells within you. Do you like it when people vandalize the church? If somebody were to come like they did a few years ago and spray paint a swastika on the side of the church, would that upset you? Would that make you angry? Or if they burned it down? Think about this. What do you do to your own body? What do you allow to go on to your body knowing that God is dwelling within you? You're allowing the world to vandalize God's temple by doing those things because our worship is not focused on Christ, it's focused on the world. Worshiping a spirit touches our emotion. Emotions are not something physical. Like, I can smile and still be upset. We've, we're really good at putting on masks, and so our emotions are internal. What was the movie that came out a few years ago uh, about the girl who had all the emotions in her head? Inside out. Inside out. That's how, emo not literally, but our emotions are kind of like that. You know, people don't see it unless we allow it to come through. So if somebody is angry, but they're not showing it, we don't know they're mad. If somebody is happy or sad, but they're not showing it, we don't know that they're happy or that they're sad. But when we truly worship God, and we're focused on worshiping a spirit, God's in control. No matter what the situation is, no matter how difficult it is, we can respond appropriately because the Holy Spirit is guiding our emotions. But again, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. If somebody pulls out in front of me and drives slower than the speed limit, I ignore the Holy Spirit for a few seconds. But next, worshiping in truth, it touches the mind. Our mind is our thoughts, our intentions, our rationality, our logic. Our mind is like an emotional filter. When we focus on the truth, it will dictate our actions instead of being driven by emotions alone. So Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So Scripture judges our thoughts, judges our intentions, judges our actions, our emotions, our motivations. Scripture does that, and the Holy Spirit is active through that, showing us if we're truly righteously angry or if we're getting in our feelings. And we're allowing the world to dictate what we're doing and who we are. Worshiping in spirit and truth touches the will. The will is when we make up our mind and we actually act. And so it's like a process. You know, we start with emotions. We feel a certain way. Then we filter that through the logic of the mind. Is this appropriate? Is this the Holy Spirit? Is this me just living sinfully? And then it causes our will, our desire to understand what we're doing and actually act and do something. If we're worshiping a spirit and truth, that means that we are going to look more like Jesus than the world. That means if someone yells at us or tries to fight us or something else, we're not going to immediately reciprocate with the same thing. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. We're going to look like Jesus. We're going to love like Jesus. We're going to show grace and mercy like Jesus. And so understanding truth results in a desire to obey God more fully. And our growing to understand the will of God, it impacts everything about us. When you open up your book, when you get home and you look at your homework, are you doing that in a manner that would glorify God? If you work, are you doing it in a manner that would glorify God? If you're in a relationship, 
Are you doing it in a manner that would glorify God? When you're alone with just the boys and you're hanging out, or the girls, because girls like to gossip too, is what you're saying glorifying God? Because that is going to show you the intention of your heart. That is going to show you your will and your desire. So if you're saying and doing things that are contrary to your faith, then there's either a logical disconnect or there's no faith. Because believers don't continue to act like the world. Christ allowed that person to die and be resurrected into new life. And so our worship, our actions, our thoughts should be dictated by the Holy Spirit. Again, we're not perfect. We have moments where we do things that are stupid. But we should not desire to do those things. We should not desire to look like the world, to act like the world. I think this would be interesting. If I were to poll your friends at school and they were to tell me everything you've said or done in the last 48 hours, would it look like Jesus or would it look like the world? That shows you what you worship or who you worship. But when we're focused on God, it causes us to worship God more, to be more obedient. And so from the very beginning, and this is what I love about Scripture, or one of the things, when we go back to Genesis 2.15, that's where God puts Adam in the garden, he says, to cultivate and to work the garden. Some scholars of Hebrew said that this could also be translated as worship and obey. And so when God gives us an opportunity, gives us a job to do, we do that by worshiping God and obeying Him. Our genuine worship leads to obedience. If you trust your parents, you're going to be more likely to do what they ask you to do. If you trust your friends, you're going to be more willing to confide in them or to go along with whatever it is they're going to do. If you truly trust God, you're going to be obedient. You're going to do what God is telling you to do. And how do you know what God's telling you to do? By opening up the Word. By reading, by listening. Our worship or devotion to God is evident in our speech and in our actions. When you're not here, if you sound like the world, your worship is messed up. Because you shouldn't have to be one person at church and somebody else somewhere else. It should be continuous. So who do you worship when it's just you or your buddies? So we spent a good bit talking about private worship or personal worship, and that's very important. Now we're going to talk about corporate worship. And so there's several, several things that we do in a corporate worship service. One of those is singing. This does not have to be hymns or what's popular on K-Love. I'll tell you this personally. Whenever I first became a Christian, the first two albums that I worshipped to, like legitimately worshipped to, were DC Talk, which is like a Christian rock band, and Skillet. Neither one of those bands would show up on a Sunday morning set list. So it's not about what's popular. It's not about what's in between the pages of a hymnal. Because if you really study theology, some of those hymns they wrote are not biblical. But we still sing them because they're in that hymn book. Some of the songs that are sung on K-Love are not biblical. And yet we sing them because it's been told to us that they're biblical, that they're Christian. You could take God out and put a boyfriend or a girlfriend in there and it would say the exact same thing. You have to pay attention to what you're listening to. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. So singing is one of those things. I did an experiment a couple years ago. We played Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. You know, nobody's heard or watched that show in like 15 years. And yet everyone knew every single word to that show. Music impacts what you do, whether you realize it or not. There are songs from 25 years ago that I have not listened since then, but I could probably sing them word for word now. Because music has a special place for us. And so when we sing... We really need to focus on worshiping God. When we listen to music, we need to worship God because He's given you that voice. Whether you sing like an angel or you sing like a concrete being drug across asphalt. God said make a joyful noise. He didn't say it had to be pretty. If you're worshiping God and not worrying about anyone else, it's not going to matter what you sound like because your heart, your desire, your passion, your intent is going to be where it needs to be to glorify God. So singing, Colossians 3.16 states, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The two most important parts of that verse are the very beginning and the very end. The word of Christ. How do we worship? How do we know what to worship? Through the word of Christ, through Scripture. We would not know how to appropriately worship God if we did not have the Bible. 
Now, we read in the Old, Old Testament that there were, there were cults, there were these religions that were sacrificing their children to their gods. They were like temple prostitutes and those kind of things to where they would go and they would do what they do in those temples because they thought that they were worshiping God because they felt like if they did that, that their God, which was Balaam, would allow their, their crops to grow. If they sacrificed their children to Molech, he would allow them to be prosperous. And so these people thought that worshiping God meant killing their kids. They thought that worshiping God meant sleeping around with whoever as long as it was in the temple. So God gives us his text and says, those things are not how you worship me. This is how you worship me. So we learn how to worship God through the text, through the word of Christ. If we didn't have God's word, we would not be worshiping correctly. If you never read the word of God, how do you know how to worship correctly? If you don't pay attention in church or pay attention when someone is speaking or preaching, how do you know how to worship God correctly? And the second thing is in your heart. Worship starts within you, not when you raise your hands, not when you kneel down, not when you stand up, not when you stand on the stage. Worship starts here, in your heart. When your heart is right with God, the correct response will follow with your body. When you are where you need to be with God, you don't have to worry about your actions, because God's going to take care of that. But if you're not, you're going to be living a double life. It doesn't matter how many times you show everyone around you that you're worshiping. If God is not leading you to do it, it does not glorify him. It's fake. It's worthless. Praying is the next one. This is personal, but it's also corporate. There's something, this is something we need to do alone, but it's also something we need to do in groups. Just like Jesus went off by himself to pray, we need to do that. But Jesus also prayed with the disciples. We need to pray with each other. Whether it's in this room, if it's just the two of you, two friends together, and you have something going on, you need to pray. Isaiah 56, 7. It says, Even then I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So the church is a place for you to pray. Not this building, but each one of you that is a born-again believer is the church. God dwells within you. So no matter where you go, Jesus says, If two or more are gathered in my name, I'm with them also. So you can pray with each other as the church. You can pray by yourself and have that conversation with God. You can do it with other people. Let your life be one of constant prayer. In the 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says, Rejoice always. That's not up there. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in everything. You want to understand the will of God? That's it. Always rejoice. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in everything. That verse finishes by saying, For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything. It is God's will for us to rejoice not based on our circumstances, but because of Christ Jesus. We pray not based on our circumstances, but because of Christ Jesus. We give thanks not based on our circumstances, but because of Christ Jesus. God's will for our worship is to be thankful for what Christ has done, which will bring us before God with a thankful heart, because out of our thankfulness, it will cause us to be obedient which will draw us closer to God. The next thing is Scripture. As I mentioned earlier, we don't know how to worship God unless we, we have the text. We don't know how to worship God without His Word. So our understanding of Scripture impacts our prayer life. Our understanding of Scripture impacts what kind of music we listen to or what kind of music we sing and literally everything else in our lives. We know Christ because of the Word. We need to repent because of the Word. We know to humble ourselves before God because of the Word. And so how do we learn Scripture? We study it. We listen. We seek it out through preaching, through teaching, through small groups, whatever it may be. Get in the Word if you really want to know God's will for your life, if you really want to know God. We do this on Wednesdays in the, here in the sanctuary. We do it on Sundays in Sunday school. We do it in the main sanctuary through corporate worship. We do it with our families, or we should. We should do it with our friends. We should do it by ourselves. It's your responsibility to grow in your faith. I'm here to help you. But I can't make you grow. I can't make you repent and trust Christ. You have to make that decision. Paul writes an important verse about our responsibility when it comes to Scripture. In Romans 10, 14 through 15, he says, How then are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him who they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? But how are they to preach unless they're sin? So there's this circular thing going on. If we don't know, we don't believe. How can you know something, if, or how can you believe something if you don't know it? If we don't believe, we don't tell. 
If we don't believe in something, we're not going to tell people about it. And if we don't tell, nobody's going to know. So if we don't know, we don't believe. If we don't believe, we don't tell. And if we don't tell, no one else is going to know. But on the flip side, if we do know, we believe. If you do know Christ, if you do know the Word, you will believe it. If we do believe, we will tell people. If we tell people, they will know also. The way the church grows is by us believing, by knowing the Word, believing it, going and telling it and living it out. The next one's giving. This is another way to worship God. We see numerous scripture that tells God, or that God tells us what will happen if we're willing to give, and some that will tell us if, we're, if we don't want to give. God blesses us when we give. This does not necessarily mean material things, but it means that it will build our trust in God. God tells us to test him in this. This is one of the only things in scripture that God says, test me. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. God tells us that if we give, he's going to bless us. That does not mean he's going to make you rich. But what that does is that develops trust in God because you realize that he is the one that's in control of your life, not your money, not your finances, not your situations. And I've learned personally, it, there were times where I didn't tithe and a bill just magically came up out of nowhere. Not magically, but it just happened. There were times where I was terrified of what was going to happen, but I tithed and God blessed us and God took care of it. A lot of times our financial situations are dictated by our faith in God. Are you going to be faithful to God no matter what? Or are you going to allow the world to influence what you're doing? I'm not telling you to give every, piece, every dime in your, in your piggy bank or in your bank account. But God does say that we need to give because Christ gave everything for us. And so Acts 20, 35 says that Jesus told us it is more blessed to give than to receive. We tell everybody that at Christmas because we don't want our kids to be like, I want all the presents. It's better to give than receive. But this is Acts 20, 35. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each one of us must do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is not saying give him all, his, all of your money. He doesn't want you to give it begrudgingly to where you're handing them that dollar and you're holding on to it as tightly as you can. He wants you to give out of the abundance of the love that you have for Christ to help someone else. We talked about this in the earlier chapters of Acts to where they sold what they had to make sure everyone had what they needed. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to make sure that there's no one with need. He wants us to make sure that everyone is taken care of. He doesn't want us to have a, a 2022 vehicle whenever our neighbor is starving. He wants us to take care of each other. If we give out of obligation, it's no different than raising our hands without God provoking us to do it. You can give everything you own to the poor, but if you're not doing it out of obedience or because you're grateful to God, it is not going to honor God. People may be excited and may be appreciative, but God's going to be like, eh, that's not it. God also tells us not to brag about what we have either or what we give. So Matthew 6, uh, 1 through 4, it says, Watch out, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward that they'll ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. If you want to help somebody, don't post it on social media. Don't brag about the fact that you helped someone. Keep it a secret. Let it be between you and that person. And if you don't want them to know, give it to them in a way that they don't know where it's coming from. Because we're doing it out of obedience to Christ, not because we want our ego to be bigger but because we want people to think that we're generous. We're doing it to glorify God. So make sure when you give, you're doing it for the glory of God and not for the admiration of man. This one chapter, this one psalm encapsulates just about everything that has to do with worship. So I'm going to read this. I've got the CSB. I'm not sure what translation that is. Okay, cool. Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his, his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations.